Hello again and welcome to another Mordian Glory Old World video. In today's episode, we shall be casting our ever critical eye over another Old World unit. And once more, we shall be traveling to the Empire. But we're not going to be mucking in with the lowly ranks, the militia and the state troops. This time we are going to the tippity top of the mountain and we're going to start looking at some characters. And where better to start than with the commanders of the Empire, the generals and the captains. And so without further ado, let us draw our swords and lead our men right into today's episode. As is tradition, let us begin with a cheeky gander at these characters' stat line. The more basic command of the Empire is the Captain. He has a movement of 4, a weapon skill of 5, a ballistic skill of 5, which is actually really good. Strength 4, toughness 4, only 2 wounds, it does make him a bit fragile. Initiative 4, 2 attacks, it's quite low. Leadership 8, but he does only cost 45 points. That's really the saving grace of the stat line. Because otherwise, that's kind of unimpressive. Weapon skill is nice. Blizzard skill is nice. But two wounds and two attacks really does make this guy kind of fragile. And he's not putting out a huge amount of damage either. The step up from the captain is the general. Now, this guy is going to cost 90 points. So, it's double that of a captain. He has the same movement. The same weapon skill. Same blizzard skill. Same strength. Same toughness. Where the improvements are is he does have an extra wound, which is going to make him a little bit more durable. Initiative 5 makes him a bit faster. 3 attacks means there's some actual volume there. And leadership 9 is going to be good for keeping the rest of the blokes in line. Both of these characters are regular infantry. Their base size comes as 25 by 25, but you can put them on a variety of mounts. And they're unit size of 1, and they come with hand weapon and light armor. They have lots and lots of different options. One of the great things about Commands of the Empire is you can kind of tailor them to however you want. You can have a guy with additional hand weapon for just three points. You give them a great weapon for four points. A halberd for three points. A lance, as long as you are appropriately mounted, for four points. A handgun, that's kind of cool. You can give them a gun. And considering they are ballistic skill five, that's not a bad option whatsoever. And that costs you six points. And you've got a longbow for four points. I probably wouldn't bother with the longbow. I definitely, for two points more, i definitely go for the handgun every single time. You can also take one of the following. You have a pistol for five points or a braided pistols for ten points. Now, bear in mind, you can only shoot one or the other. You can either shoot your handgun or your pistol or your braided pistols. You're kind of going to want to choose between, do you want to have a guy who's going to be doing like one long pop shot with the handgun or do you want someone who's going to pull out a brace of pistols go full john wick and start blasting people i quite like the brace of pistols out of all of the gun options i think that's the best firstly you get two shots and you've got the ballistic skill to kind of absorb the minus one to hit from firing multiple shot it can be quite cheeky to have a general of the empire and a captain of the empire in a big block of state troops you've run a quite traditional loadout and give both of them pistols that way when someone charges your unit of soldiers you actually get to put out four pistol shots on standard shoot before you then start fighting and having two characters plus the standard shoot plus the spearman means that you actually have a decent chance of surviving a charge from a half decent enemy combat unit which is not something empire can normally boast about to be honest you also have a number of defensive upgrades each character can take a shield for two points you can replace your light armor with heavy armor for three points or you can go for full plate at six points the fact that you can get full plate armor on even a low level character such as the captain of the empire is fantastic in my opinion you want to go full plate every day of the week it's not even something you want to think about it's a no 
In terms of magic items, a general of the empire may take up to 100 points, a captain of the empire may take up to 50 points, and a captain of the empire can be upgraded to a battle standard bearer for 25 points. Regardless of whether it's a general of the empire or a captain of the empire, both commanders come with the hold the line special rule, which means that any unit they join automatically passes panic tests. That might seem fairly basic maybe not even that exciting but remember this is old world leadership is everything breaking and running away is going to lose you the game nine times out of ten so anything that stops that from happening is a good thing however if i was to be brutally honest i do find the captain and generals of the empire to be very lackluster considering that these are meant to be some of our best characters especially with the gem of the empire he's meant to be the head honcho right his damage output is kind of tragic three attacks even if you try and pump him up with combat gear such as go for the sword of battle or the fencer's blades at best you're looking at like four or five attacks and weapon skill five might be good by empire standards but most other combat characters out there are going to have a higher weapon skill than you which means that at best if you get into a duel you're going to hit them probably on a four and they're probably going to hit you on a three and speaking from bitter experience the captain of the empire can't fight his way out of a wet paper bag and he goes down remarkably quickly because he's only got two wounds but despite these scathing remarks you're still going to take these commanders of the empire because there are a couple of ways you can make them work and frankly in one capacity they are downright essential you go through a lot of your empire units your leadership caps out at leadership seven or leadership eight even on elite things like great swords and unlike other armies like Bretonians or even Orcs and Goblins or Chaos, we don't have Warband. It's not really a thing. You get it a bit on the Free Company, but by and large, you don't have Warband. And so Leadership 7, Leadership 8 is very, very dicey. You start losing combats, you're relying on Leadership 7 to hold the line, you ain't going to do it. This is where you need the Captain of the Empire, the Battle Standard. A battle standard bearer allows all units within the command range, I believe with the battle standard, it's actually upgraded to 12 inches to re-roll your leadership. So suddenly, even the camp captain with a BSB, you're going to be leadership 8 re-rollable. And then if you go for the general of the empire and use his command range, and you make him the general so he can be, or even foot slogging, have a 12-inch command range, that's going to be leadership 9. That is much, much more reliable. You're much more likely to actually not break and flee or just disintegrate if you're leadership nine rollable. I've tried having Empire State troops just stand on their own merit. I've tried to just have a block of like 30 spearmen and be like, oh yeah, they're going to have like close order and they're going to have um, lots of ranks and a banner. They're going to have loads of static combat reds. Really, it doesn't work. You're probably going to lose your combat to the Empire with your basic troops. And if you're going down the basic troop route, you need the general and the captain to have that insulating bubble of re-rollable leadership. Without it, your army will, not maybe, will fall apart. I understand for some people that's going to be a little bit disheartening. After all, you don't really want your badass heroes being glorified babysitters. There is one thing more that does make generals and captains of the empire potentially really really decent in fact downright good which is they are your access to monstrous mounts i'm not talking demi griffins i'm talking full-blown griffin considering your captain of the empire only costs 45 points he can still take a griffin as a mount and griffins are badass. They're going to give your Empire Captain plus one toughness. And they're going to give him plus three wounds. Suddenly, being two wounds isn't so bad. Suddenly, you're actually rocking around with five wounds on your Captain. And yeah, the griffin is going to cost 130 points. But combined, your Captain of the Empire on a griffin is only going to cost 175. And he is going to have four attacks from the griffin. 
Three of which are going to be at strength five, AP minus two. And another one is going to be strength user, no AP, but armor bane two with multiple wounds two. That's the uh, serrated maw. And the first weapon was the wicked claws. You then also have the fact that the Empire Captain himself has his attacks. He has two attacks there. And if you give him that brace of pistols, he is going to have the stand and shoot, or just the ability to shoot people. And he's also going to get an extra attack in combat if they're the only weapons you give him. You also have the magical equipment you can give them, but I am a little worried that if you start spaffing out 50 points on lots of magical gear, that the main advantage of a Captain on Griffin, which is being cheap for a monstrous hero, is going to start leaking away. I quite like the idea of just having a captain, giving him a lance, giving him full plate, and giving him a shield, which is in total going to cost you 45 points plus full plate is 6 points plus a lance 4 points, that's 55 points, plus a shield is going to be 57 points. Put him on a griffin of 130, so that's going to be 187 points. And you have a character which is going to have toughness 5 with, I believe, a 3 plus save because you have full plate plus you've got the uh, plus you've got the shield. It might be a 2 plus, I believe it's a 3 plus save. And he's going to have 5 wounds. And he's going to have 6 attacks. At, what, strength? Some of them are going to be strength 5 AP2. Some of them are going to be strength 6 AP2. They're going to be quite good. And then you've got the stomp attacks as well. And you cause terror. And you fly. And you've got to stride. And you've got close order. See what I mean? There's quite a lot going there for 187 points. That's a good bully character. Just fly him around and have him just be an absolute nightmare for some of your opponent's more isolated dudes. Or just start having him hitting into the flank. Relatively cheap, very punchy flexible combat empire character something that the army can struggle with of course you've also got the general of the empire and you can go absolutely bonkers with this guy if you want to turn into a combat character you can do it's going to cost you a pretty penny you do get what you pay for you can have like the bronze tier captain griffin or you can go for the platinum platinum level general of the empire you put him on an Imperial Griffin, which is 160 points, you have that Imperial Griffin have an extra head for 20 points. Suddenly, it is putting out just a mind-boggling amount of attacks. It's going to be st five strength five attacks with like wicked claws and serrated more, and then it's going to have this D3 plus one stomps, and then you've got the commander who can also add his three attacks, and then he can have like sort of battle or fence blade, so he could be going up to like another another attack or two, and he's just going to be a beast. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. That's that's starting to get into. If we add it all up, double digits of attacks because you'd have five from the Griffin. Then you'd have the Stomps, which is an average of th 3 with the D3 plus 1, which is 8. Then you'd have the Empire General, who's going to have between 4 and 5 attacks. Yeah, you're looking at 12 to 13 attacks, and they're all at a good weapon skill and a decent strength and a decent AP. That's a proper combat character, but the, it's going to cost you a lot. 90 points plus 180 points. It's going to be 270 points plus probably... 80 points worth of gear at least yeah you're looking at 350 points for empire that's very 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 expensive but in comparison to a lot of other armies it's really not that bad you start looking at some of the chaos characters you start mounting them on dragons they're getting up there like 600 plus points even some of the high elf characters riding around on regular dragons they're they're pretty pricey Empire don't get dragons, which is a bit of a downside, but on the it does mean that your monster characters are a bit cheaper in comparison to a lot of other armies. So far, we've looked at two extremes of the spectrum. We've had the cheap foot slogging fourth multiplier and babysitting officers, and then we've had the more expensive and the very expensive combat characters. But you can go down the middle. Your Gem of the Empire can go on a Barded Warhorse. You can go on an Empire Warhorse, which is just a non-Barded mount. And you can also go on a Pegasus. 
and you can go on a demigriff. By the way, I think I said before that you couldn't put a commander on a demigriff. That was a mistake. Uh, I thought you could only put a grandmaster or chapter master on them, but no, you absolutely can put a general of the empire or captain of the empire on a demigriff. And that is, out of all of these in-between options, the most enticing one. Barter war horses and regular war horses are all right, but they don't really solve a lot of the problems you're going to have with things like the captain of the empire, where he's only got two wounds, so he's just going to die. Going on a Pegasus does give you an extra wound and a, an extra, no, no extra stuff, just an extra wound, and does make you have a couple of extra attacks on the Pegasus. But I don't think the Pegasus is really good for a captain or general of the Empire because it doesn't make them that much more durable. And they can't join, unlike Petonians, a unit of Pegasus Knights because they don't exist in the Empire. I think the Pegasus are more for your wizards going around on those and having uh, much more mobility for their spells and good line of sight and stuff like that. But the Demigriff is an entirely different story. Firstly, it gives you plus one wound. Secondly, it does come with barding. So if you've got a Empire character with full plate and shield on Demigriff, they're going up to a two plus save and they're getting the extra wound. But the big thing is the Demogriff actually boosts their combat output really impressively. Three attacks at strength five, weapon skill four, AP minus two. It's a cheap way. It is a cheap way of taking a captain of the Empire or general of the Empire and 50 points just doubling, if not more, the amount of good attacks they're going to put out. It's like getting three extra great weapon attacks without striking last. And you get a better save. And you get more wounds. And even more importantly, it does allow them to start joining units of Empire Demigriff Knights. Which are, frankly, the best unit in the entire Empire Army. That's not an exaggeration. They are hugely efficient for their points cost. And we will be doing a video on those in the near future. The only reason you might not want to put a... Demigriff Captain or General in a unit of Demigriff Knights. The only reason it's not a total no-brainer is because of another character in the Empire roster, the Masters of the Knightly Orders. These can either be your Chapter Masters or your Grand Masters. They're your proper combat characters. Generally speaking, they have a higher weapon skill, a higher initiative, and more attacks. And they can go on Demigriffs, and when they join you at Demigriff Knights, they make them immune to psychology. Whereas... Man of the Empire just makes you immune to panic. I don't feel it's going to be as relevant on mounted units as it will be on infantry. Masters of the Knightly Orders are a bit more expensive. You do get what you pay for. So you might want a cheap combat character to go to the Demigriff Knights, at which point you'd go down the general route. But I think you'll probably lean towards having Grandmasters leading Demigriffs and Knights and having generals either on Mondra's mounts or leading your infantry. That's my instinct with these characters. Overall, I think that commanders of the Empire are a little bit of a mixed bag. You have to be very careful with what you're using them for, and I am worried they could be a bit of a trap for newer players. There was certainly a trap for me when I first started playing Empire in the old world. If you expect them to be able to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, with their counterparts in other infantry blocks, you will be sorely disappointed. A captain of the Empire, even a general of the Empire, will be outfought by a goblin big boss or goblin war boss. But if you use them as force multipliers, or you use them to get access to cheap and relatively cheap in comparison to other armies, monstrous mounts, then I think you can get some really good mileage out of them. But of course, all of this is just like my opinion, man. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Are you a fan of these captains and generals? If so, how would you use them? Or do you think that there are better characters in the Empire roster? If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to smash that like button and also subscribe to never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? 
If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is a lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patreons you guys are amazing truly the lifeblood of the channel i could not do more doing glory full-time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patreons these are the War Masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. To a heartfelt thank you to Alex Dengal, Bon Bon Vert, Mad Larkin, Marcus Roberts, Mark Panconi, RJ Scorpion, Swordfish Trombone, Try Again Bragg, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox, and August Barney. Seriously guys, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your support is incredible and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Hope you've all enjoyed today's video. And of course, as always, see you guys next time. <laughs>